our Bibles open, we're going to be in Acts chapter 4 this morning, Acts chapter 4, and we're continuing our series. We're going to wrap this up in the next couple of weeks, the marks of a mighty church. What identifies a mighty church for God? And uh, we've seen several of those identification marks, and looking forward to this morning here, we are going to see um, regarding a mighty church, the church assembled, the assembly of a church. And that's ultimately, that's what the word ecclesia, uh, the word ecclesia is, is, the, is the Greek word that we get the word church from in the Bible. And so uh, that word, by nature, by definition, it means an assembly, to assemble, a called out assembly. And so we're going to see one of the identification marks of a mighty church is that of an assembled church. Avengers assemble, <laughs> but um, a church is an assembly of born-again, baptized believers called out from the world that are gathered together to fulfill the Great Commission. And I've given that definition uh, scores of times already, but I think as you uh, uh, think on that, if you didn't already understand that, it, it makes perfect sense. Uh, we are not just a, a another organization. Somebody said this morning, I think in the lesson, maybe Brother Dave said, um, we're not a social club or something of that. We do socialize and we do gather together. We do have social events, but that's not what our existence is. Uh, that's for other. Did you say social social club? Do you remember? Um, and I've I've alluded to that in the past as well, but. Uh, we are we are gathered for a purpose. We're gathered to worship, and we're gathered because of Christ. We're gathered because of God. We're not gathered for ourselves necessarily. In Acts chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 31, verse number 31. Now, this is one of the first churches, if not, if it didn't contain the first members of the first church, uh, I believe it, in fact, does. Uh, I happen to believe that uh, the Bible teaches that in order to be a church, you need to have the Spirit of God living in you. Uh, the individual does, and so those individuals that have the Spirit of God living in them, they constitute, as they assemble, they, they constitute or they make the church. And then they're assembled for a purpose, and that purpose is to perpetuate the gospel, to fulfill the Great Commission. And so in the upper room, I happen to believe that's, that's, that's what I kind of, uh, I'm not dogmatic about it. Some say the church started at Pentecost, uh, but uh, Jesus, as the disciples were gathered in the upper room, he, the Bible says he breathed on them the Holy Ghost. And so that assembly from there, I believe uh, uh, this church that we're going to read about largely had those men in it, and we'll see some of those here. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we see one of the first churches, if not the first church, as we're reading in this passage here, the church of Jerusalem. It says, and when they had prayed, that's another activity. Of course, we know that people do at church. When they prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness, and the multitude of them that believed uh, were of one heart. We see several activities that were taking place with this assembly. They prayed. Uh, they prayed, the Bible says, with such, I believe, such power. The place was shaken. I don't know if that was earthquake-type sh type shaking. Uh, they were filled with the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God. And then they spake the Word of God with boldness. That's what we're attempting to do here again this morning, speaking the Word of God, hopefully with, with boldness. Uh, and so the activity of uh, this church that was going on, and it says, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own. There was selfless um, gathering, assembling, taking place. Neither said any of them that ought of these things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Uh, there was witnessing going on. What were they witnessing? They were witnessing the resurrection of Jesus. They're 
there witnessing what is the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. And so they were witnessing of that. That's what we do as a local church. We're witnessing that Jesus rose from the dead. Uh, he is the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, no man cometh unto the Father but by Christ. And so they witnessed of the resurrection. And great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought uh, the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. They were selfless. They were gracious in helping uh, supply the wants and needs of the other uh, people of God. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, it says, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Let's go ahead and pray. We'll get into our message here this morning. God, I thank you for the privilege it is to be a preacher of your word. God, I pray that you'd minister to hearts here this morning as only you can. God, I need you. I acknowledge my need for you. I pray that you'd fill me with your Holy Spirit. I pray that you'd help me to communicate only those words that you'd have me to speak. Lord, I pray that you'd make spirit-filled listeners and that you'd accomplish only that which you can in the hearts of, of your people here this morning. I pray that we'd see one of these identifications, this one of these marks of a mighty church, and we desire to be one of those for you. God, I pray that there's somebody here that has not trusted you as personal Savior. They don't know for certain that heaven will be their home when their fleshly body uh, dies. I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Lord, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts once again in Christ's name. Amen. In this passage that we just uh, finished reading, and we've, we've read uh, this passage before in the past and or parts of it, but we see the disciples were assembled together in prayer. One of our goals as Christians is to be disciples. If you're saved, it ought to be uh, one of your desires and, and goals in your life is to be a disciple, to be a child of God. And a disciple is always growing. You don't reach a, uh, you don't reach a plateau. You don't plateau off. You don't reach a, a certain level of disciple maturity, and that's it. We're continuing to grow as disciples of Christ. But here we see in this passage that they were assembled together and uh, as they were assembled together, some of the activity that took place was prayer. Another one of the activities that took place was they spoke the word of God. They spoke with boldness. There was sacrificial giving that took place at their meeting uh, that they were having at their assembly. And so very similar to what takes place here already and what's going to take place hopefully, as we preach with boldness. Uh, but uh, we see that as the activity that take place with this, uh, one of the first local churches here, I'm going to call it the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem. And why do you say Baptist? Because we identify with the doctrines that they were preaching. We identify with what they were doing here. Um, it's, it's an identity idea there. And so I know in talking uh, with pastors, uh, fellow pastors, that one of the greatest concerns that there has been among this time of COVID is that people uh, may be getting accustomed to sitting home and not assembling as a church as God intended us uh, to assemble. And uh, you have to admit that that could be a concern amongst uh, not only pastors, but it should be a concern amongst Christians as well. And uh, there are those that uh, uh, it's now an excuse. It's an excuse not to attend church because, man, because you haven't attended because of the fear of COVID, because of maybe passing a, a sickness along one to another. And I believe we ought to use caution, and we're doing so. Uh, we attempt to do so. We have sanitization uh, stations in the back. We have masks available for those who like to wear those and such. But, uh, uh, but the fact that God wants us to assemble uh, there are not excuses that supersede that fact. Amen? Amen. And so God knows God is in full control. And uh, this, this, this age and this time that we, we, we live in, 
uh, there's the concern uh, for people not wanting uh, to assemble. But uh, there are those that are getting out of church. But then there are also those that are getting accustomed to what some might call digital worship or online services. Be honest with me this morning. How many of you in recent, well, within the recent year, how many of you have watched church services online a lot? Or watched church services online, period, where maybe you hadn't really watched church services online uh, prior to this COVID area that we're in. Raise your hand with that. Uh, okay. And so proof positive there. I'm, I'm one that would testify of that. I'm, I've, uh, I've watched services online before. Uh, I've mostly listened to them by way of like a DVD or, or, uh, or uh, a streaming, just the audio. Uh, but up until recently, this past year, um, I didn't like, I still don't like it. I don't like being recorded on my messages. I don't like the messages to be recorded and people seeing that. Then I go back and if I'm listening to it, I'm like, man, you're, you're a terrible preacher. Uh, and I'm all, I analyze myself and, and I, it gives me low self-esteem, I think. And, and, uh, but anyway, um, going back and looking at a message that is preached live is uh, something that is becoming more and more prevalent in our day and age that we live in right now. Back last year, as the whole COVID uh, situation hit, there was a, a pastor, well-known pastor, you probably know him, Andy Stanley. How many are familiar with that name, Andy Stanley? Uh, the son of Charles Stanley. How many know Charles Stanley? Raise your hand. And so Andy Stanley, he was uh, known for making a statement. They had announced at their church, it's a mega church, uh, but they said that they were going to quit in-person services altogether for at least one year. And that would have brought them to August of this year um, for sake of trying to be safe and such. And, and But there was a specific statement that was made. And the statement that was made was, was something to the effect of this. Uh, the emphasis was that the mission of the church was not necessarily or was not to assemble. And I would beg to differ with that. Uh, the uh, one of the goals and the missions of the church is 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 the very word. The name church means to assemble, and so uh, I believe they are. They have resumed services uh, in person uh, to this day, and it's not well. It, we just hit August first today, but uh, this announcement uh, since has changed. They're meeting now. Uh, but this was a statement that was made nevertheless. And so don't get me wrong. I, I think that there is a time and a place. I think that online services uh, can be a valuable tool. I think that they can be a valuable tool for the cause of Christ. And, and that's what it in fact should be, a tool. I think of it can be a tool for uh, shut-ins, guys like maybe Ron and his mother who are in a hospital right now, or people as... Uh, uh, People that maybe aren't aren't able to to physically leave and 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 come. Maybe somebody there's their vehicle they're having vehicle issues and they're not able to make it. And, and there's a time and a place for a live stream service. There's a time and a place for uh, for a for or a digital service. Uh, but it should not be the new norm to be digital digital in our worship to God. And I believe we're going to see here this morning several reasons why it can't be that. And so church is to be an assembly. By definition, we understand that. Most things, I want to say this, are much better in person. Who would agree with that? Uh, I think of, uh, we just had, celebrated the 4th of July. There are fireworks. How many of you enjoy fireworks? How many of you enjoy watching the fireworks, right? How many of you enjoy setting them off? Um, I like fireworks. I, I like big extravagant fireworks. I like to be able to light off the fireworks. I don't necessarily like paying for fireworks. I like lighting people's fireworks off, the people that have paid the money uh, to uh, buy the fireworks, but, but I enjoy that. Uh, I don't enjoy watching fireworks online. I don't enjoy watching. There were several memes that I saw as 4th of July hit, and nobody wants to see your, your 4th of July fireworks display from your phone that you recorded. And that's the truth. I don't want to watch somebody's fireworks uh, that they, uh, last year we were in Hawaii and we celebrated uh, the 4th of July. We left the North Shore. Hawaii is major on fireworks and 4th of July, Independence Day. But uh, we had left, I think, the family's house and we were coming up the North Shore. You got to kind of climb the hill 
as you go up over the, uh, the middle of the part of the island. And there's an army base, the Schofield Army Base in the center part of the island. And so we were coming up uh, to a Schofield about the time they, start, they started setting off the fireworks. We were coming up at the end of it, and uh, they just started. Um, everybody had pulled over off the main highway, and there was literally, I, I wouldn't doubt if it was a mile plus long of vehicles that had pulled over on the side of the road, and they were watching this fireworks display. And it was, it was, a, it was an extravagant fireworks uh, display, but if you'd asked me, do I, did I record it and, or did I want to watch it from somebody's phone, uh, not in person? No, I wouldn't have wanted to do that. I, and uh, things are just much better typically in person because it's better in person. I think of online or e-learning with our kids. All the parents would agree that in person is much better uh, than e-learning, right? Uh, but, but I think of that, I'm going to give you some statistics regarding that that I heard. It was reported that through the pandemic, 40% of students that were in the school district of St. Paul, Minnesota, they failed at least one grade through online schooling. I think one of the consequences of not having the in-person, and how many of you would testify that, that it was a struggle uh, for your kids? I got a story we're going to share uh, in just a moment, that it's it's hilarious, uh, but uh, but in person is much better. Uh, physically is much better. In Baltimore, Maryland, the average GPA for the students online uh, during the COVID during the pandemic, uh, the average GPA for the students was 1.2. 1. 1.2 1. 2 in uh, the district of, uh, well, I don't know what district exactly, but that's in Baltimore, Maryland. Most everything that there is is better in person. And so what I want you to specifically notice this morning is that the church assembled the very nature of the word, the Greek word ekklesia, church, which means an assembly or to assemble, is better in person. Um, And so this morning, I want for us to notice several reasons why God doesn't want us staying home for church, why it's impossible for that matter, uh, for that to happen. How many parents can testify of trying to keep your kids focused during e-learning? We did it in Hawaii for a time. Uh, they, uh, towards the end of the first, uh, that when it first uh, had happened and then coming here, uh, we were able to have them in person, but then there's the e-learning days. And I think that's trying to, as they do that, maybe trying to get them accustomed to if we need to do that in the future. But, but uh, uh, on, <laughs> online service, how many of you ever seen the, the videos of the, uh, the person that was uh, doing the interview? And it was, an, it was an online interview, and the guy was fully dressed from the, from the top down, but then he was in his shorts and slippers from the waist down. Because he could do that because it was an e, uh, it was an online interview. Well, I'm going to get started in the message here. Number one, digital worship is distracted worship. Digital worship is distracted worship. Now, this is a uh, this is a point here that one of the more practical points. Uh, not necessarily. I don't have scripture that uh, that that shows this as uh, as being a. Uh, a, a dogmatic point, but I think common sense would allude to the fact that digital worship can be distracted worship. Um, and so, trying to keep kids focused during e-learning, I think of watching online services. I think of uh, how many times I, I'll go back maybe and watch uh, some of the service, and then somebody will complain. Usually, it's my mom. Uh, something's, something is wrong with the sound. I can't hear and something of that nature, or uh, thinking that uh, preaching is going on, and then there's a bad connection, and so the preacher will freeze up, and then the person will be sitting there waiting for it to come up, or especially if you got terrible, or maybe anybody have dial-up service anymore? But I can only imagine somebody with dial-up service trying to watch a trying to watch an online church service, and then the, the problems that could be had as a result of that. Or there's audio problems. The temperature isn't perfect. Or you're you're like your kid and you pick up some action figure or a, a fidget of, or something like that. And many times I'd be watching one of the boys, and we'd have three boys uh, at times this past school year on three different computers or uh, yeah, three different devices. And 
one of them's over here, and one of them's over here. Then the other one, he's supposed to be over here, but he's off doing something else on his own, getting in the refrigerator, doing something else, and, and not, not focused on what the task at hand is there. There is. And so uh, the distractions that there are, there's a bazillion of them uh, as we're, we can be trying to worship the Lord. And I think we'll see here this morning that there are a million, uh, several things we can't in fact do in our worship if it's online, if we're not assembled uh, in church. Number two, the church is the gathering of Christ's body. It's not the watching of an event. The church isn't a spectator sport. Uh, yes, we come here and, uh, and uh, we sing to the Lord and we bring offerings to the Lord and we hear the word of God preached and there's a certain element to receiving the bread of the word of God and being fed the word of God. Uh, but church ultimately is not a spectator sport. It's not an event that you watch necessarily. It's something for you to be a part of. It's for you to become a, a part of the body of Christ and get some activity involved. It is action and activity. The church is not a building to meet in necessarily. We happen to have a beautiful facility and, and we're excited that just in a few, hopefully a month or so, we're gonna have this building paid off and it will be free and clear hours. And we have the luxuries of having the, uh, uh, the, uh, the temperature in here and, and we have the luxuries of having our, our kids to be able to assemble in other rooms as they have uh, educated teachers that are, that, are, that are giving them the word of God. Uh, but, uh, but if we didn't have any of these beautiful uh, facilities, uh, the fact that we assemble would make us a church. Church is not a building to meet in. Uh, number two, the church is not an event to be watched. It's not an event to be watched. Now, we're going to have uh, cantatas. We're going to have musical numbers. We're going to have uh, Christmas candlelight services that, that there's less participation. We're going to have uh, bell choirs, and, and we're going um, to have harvest festival and trunk or treat and things like that. Uh, but th those are events that you don't necessarily participate in uh, uh, watch as a as a spectator uh, all the time, but those are some things that that you can participate in as a spectator. Uh, number number next, the church is the gathering of of Christians. The word ecclesia means to assemble. So number one, we see digital worship is distracted worship. Number two, we see the church is the gathering of Christ's body. It's not the watching of an event. Let me ask you this morning: Did you come to church? Plan on being entertained? Did you come to church to to, uh, to 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 get something out? Yeah, we ought to want to get something from when we come to church. But when we come to church, I think our primary focus ought to be, what am I going to give to God? Worship is giving to God. We're here to worship God. Number three, the church is to be hearing the word together and singing to Jesus together. We are hearing the word and singing to Jesus together. It's, uh, it's, uh, the church is the place to go uh, to, uh, to hear the word of God exposited, to hear the word of God explained, to hear the word of God expounded. And so the Bible says in Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. That's one of the key verses that we're going to see in one of our points is in just a moment. But a church is a place where, where we fulfill the one another commands that we find in Scripture. Uh, it says, uh, admonishing one another. If you're not assembling, you're not going to be admonishing me. If you're not assembling one with another, you're not going to be admonishing one another. In order to admonish, there needs to be the assembly, uh, admonishing one another. In how do we admonish? In psalms, in hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. It's not a, uh, uh, this morning, it's not a home uh, uh, online worship service, worship and waffles. It's not a, it's not a home online worship uh, service, the, the pastor and pancakes. Okay, no, we're an assembly. 
uh, I'm referring, you know, if you had to stay home, and that's, that's what you call your service. You, you, can, you can make your pancakes, and you can watch the, the pastor preach. That's, that's not what church is. If you're assembling for, if you're, if you're not coming to church for, uh, for the inconvenience that it may call you, uh, cause you, but, but you're able to, you're not right with God. Amen right there. Church is an assembly. You're a vital part of the body of Christ. If you're a Christian, you ought to want to be. The church, number four, is to gather together to encourage one another. Again, we see the one another. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 through 25 says this, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And so I want to ask you this morning, are you a discouraged Christian? Have you been discouraged lately? I encourage you to assemble. I encourage you to get around other brothers and sisters in Christ. The Bible says we're to edify one another. We're to encourage one another, exhorting one another. Get around another brother or sister in Christ, preferably somebody, another one who's not discouraged. And even if that's the case, encourage one another. Encourage one another in the Lord. One of the benefits of this assemble, assembly, church assembled. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Number five, and next regarding the church assembled. The physical gathering of the church allows us to follow the one another commands of the Bible. How many of you can, off the top of your head, give a phrase, give a scripture uh, that says one another in it? Off the top of your head, anybody? We just read two of them. Who's, who said something? Love one another? Perfect. Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> Verse 1, uh, turning your Bibles there, Ephesians chapter 4, we can, uh, there are a few in Ephesians we're going to see here. Ephesians chapter 4. And then in uh, verse number 1 here, uh, we see it says, Therefore, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit. Look down at uh, verse number 32. Verse number 32. <clears throat> Paul goes on and he says, <clears throat> Ephesians 4.32, it says, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another even as God for Christ's sake hath uh, forgiven you. And so uh, the church and worship isn't necessarily for the person that's worshiping, amen? It's not for me necessarily. What the activity that we do here isn't necessarily for me. It isn't necessarily for you. First and foremost, who is what we do here for? God, Jesus Christ. And so uh, it's, it's for the Lord. First of all, our worship is for God. Secondarily, it is for you. Secondarily, it is for me. Uh, but then it is also for the benefit and edification of others. Uh, so first, God is priority. Uh, second, I'm the next one down. And then the person next to you is the other reason why we ought to assemble. And we see in the passages here. And so we are to consider one another. We are to exhort one another. We are to forbear one another. Who can tell me what does the word forbear mean? I need to come down here. I'm not. Be patient. Uh Somebody else? What does forbearing one another mean? What does that that's part of it that would include that? I I would I would say. Who has a just a solid definition, a full comprehensive definition? Forbearing one another, toleration is involved in that. Putting up with somebody is involved in forbearing. Dealing with somebody when you don't maybe uh, necessarily when you're when your flesh doesn't feel like it. 
uh, let me read a definition, uh, some of the definition that I have right here. It says, uh, uh, to hold oneself back, um, to put up with or tolerate. And the fact of the matter is God uses other people to mature us. God uses annoying people to mature us. How many of you can testify of that fact? Don't look next to you, by it, please. Uh, but, uh, but God uses people to, uh, to, to help us, to grow us, to develop us, to perfect us, and He uses other Christians to do so as well. Number six, regarding the assembly of church, the mark of a mighty church. Number six, joyfully participating in the physical gathering of the church is proof that we belong to Jesus or one of the proofs that we belong to Jesus. You say, are you saying that you need to go to church to be a, 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 a Christian? Well, you don't get saved by going to church. Jesus is the one that saves our souls. And we need to personally come to Him, acknowledge that we are sinners, and we need to exchange our sin uh, for the Savior, for Him. That's how we get saved. Uh, but I, I will say this, dogmatically and boldly, you're not going to grow like you ought to in Christ if you're not assembled with the people of God under the Word of God. And so... <clears throat> Joyfully participating. Notice I said joyfully participating in the physical gathering. Let me say, let me say this. Uh, maybe you don't feel joyful, just come anyways, okay? Just, just participate. Sometimes, you know, we can be under the stress and burdens under the thing, over the, the things of life. That's, don't use that as an excuse to stay away from uh, the things of God. Uh, we need to, uh, uh, sometimes the things of God will, will help us to get, help us get that joy. And so recently, I heard a statement that said this, if your faith is not strong enough to get you to church, are you sure it's strong enough to get you into heaven? Now, now I thank God that I'm not, uh, I'm not going to heaven by any works that I can do. I'm going to heaven uh, by the grace of God, by having trusted Christ as my personal Savior. But as a new creature with the Spirit of God living in me, I ought to have a desire for the things of God. I ought to have an appetite for the things of God. And so uh, I think uh, a desire to go to church is fruit and it's evidence of being a new creature. Uh, and the Bible mentions in Peter, uh, the book of Peter, uh, he's, he talks about desiring the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. And so there ought to be a desire for the things of God. And so sometimes, uh, probably many of you have been there as well. You've got a loved one that uh, maybe made a, a, a profession of faith, and, and, uh, but there's not, you know, God has called us to, to be seed sowers, but not fruit inspectors. But the Bible does say you will know them by their fruits, okay? And so we got to be careful. There's a fine balance there. Uh, but uh, we ought to have a desire for the things of God if we're that new spiritual creature. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, If a man say, I love God and hate his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 says this, For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of condemnation contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Let me ask you uh, quietly, privately this morning, ask yourself this question, is there evidence of the new man in my life? If a person has no desire to assemble with brothers and sisters in Christ, it may be proof that they're not really that new creature. And uh, next here, we got to hurry. We got to hurry. Number seven, I've, I've got 25 uh, points, uh, but I condensed down into 13. So uh, number seven, we're more than halfway through, and some of these can go quicker than others. Number seven, the physical gathering of the church is to be used by God as an evangelistic tool in the world. A physical gathering of assembled believers 
uh, God uses that as an evangelistic tool. How many of you, you got saved as a result of a church, uh, uh, going to church? You got saved at a church service, saved at a church activity. Raise your hand. Sorry, I keep tricking you. I got saved February 27, 1986 on a Thursday night in an Awanas program, a youth kids program. Um, I had uh, folks that were uh, were dedicated to ministering the word to kids, and they cared about they cared about me. And I I'm thankful for that. They took the time and effort to do that. Um, but they gave an invitation. They preached the gospel, and I got saved as a result of uh, of having been invited to go to church. Now I, you don't have to get saved at church. You can get saved just out on the street. You can get saved. You can get saved on an online service. Uh, but uh, by hearing the word of God. Uh, but, uh, uh, but God uses the church as an evangelistic tool oftentimes. In John chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus says this, A new commandment I give you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this uh, shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have one, love uh, one uh, to another. And so uh, the gospel is preached. If you go to have been to a church and the gospel's not preached, I'd say that that's probably not the best. I don't know if it's a church or not. Uh, the gospel should be the emphasis. The gospel should be the center focus of the local church. What is the gospel? The death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. If people aren't hearing the gospel, the Bible says, how shall they call upon him in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear uh, without a preacher? And so God wants us to preach the gospel, and we do that at the church and the assembly. Number eight, the physical gathering of the church enables the effective use of our spiritual gifts. How many of you, uh, we, on Wednesday night, I think it was some time ago, we took a spiritual gifts test. Uh, just a simple, uh, ask a few questions, and then it's a, it's a number rating system, and then you total up, and I forget exactly how many spiritual gifts in, in Romans, but, uh, but how many of you remember taking the test, the spiritual gifts test? A few of us. And, uh, and those are spiritual gifts. When somebody gets saved, God imparts spiritual gifts to people. Uh, some of that would be administration. Some of that would be uh, ruling. Some of that would be the gift of mercy, the gift of giving. Uh, but different, different spiritual gifts that God entrusts us with at salvation. And some of these are found in, in a Romans chapter 12. And those spiritual gifts, let me say, are for the edification of the church. They're not just for you to go and, and uh, get a, uh, I don't know how it could happen, but they're not for you to get a promotion at work somehow. I don't know how that would work, like I say, but they're not for you to go and, and uh, become the next American Idol or something like that. Spiritual gifts are used for the impartation of the local church, the church body. My gifts are for you. Your gifts are for me, for my edification. Romans 12, 6 talks about this, these gifts. I'll read them quickly here. Having them gifts giver, uh, differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, the preaching, uh, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. And so how does it work? How do any of these work for that matter? If you're isolated at home, if you're isolated from the assembly, it doesn't. We can't participate and use the spiritual gifts that God has given to us. Number nine, as we're moving quickly here, God dwells more intimately. Now, I want you, you need to think about this, okay? Uh, God dwells more intimately in the gathered church than in individual Christians. I got kind of three levels I want you to understand here. Level one, level one is this. God, we understand as Christians that God is everywhere. God is omnipresent. That's one of his attributes, okay? God is everywhere. Um, he, he can be ev everywhere. He is everywhere at one time. Uh, his omnipresence in Psalm 139, verse 7, the Bible says this, 
whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither, uh, 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 David says, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? In other words, David knew that God was everywhere. Number two, secondly, um, God dwells more intimately uh, in Christians. God dwells in us. Now, it's kind of hard to imagine, but it does make sense as we continue on here. Uh, God indwells in us individually and personally those that are saved. John chapter 14, verse 7 says, Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So at the time of salvation, the Bible says the Spirit of God takes residence in our hearts. We are sealed until the day of redemption. And there's, so I want you to notice this next level here, that God dwells more intimately in the gathered church than he does in individual Christians. Now, maybe that's not the, the, the perfect wording, uh, but you see how this makes sense, right? You understand God is omnipresent? Raise your hand. You understand that God indwells you as a believer, right? Uh, and a passage for this, I want you to understand, Matthew 18, verse 20. We're, we're familiar. We know this quoting of this passage here. The Bible says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So we understand that as two or three believers are gathered together, uh, God, is, God is in the presence of us. God is in the, that's why we start off the service. The whole idea here is, is making sure that, that we are right with God. Uh, getting our hearts right with God at the beginning of the service. God, search our hearts. It's an opportunity for us to confess uh, sin. It's an opportunity for us to say, Holy Spirit, search us and know us, and, and may what I'm doing here today be pleasing to you. And, uh, and then we're corporately gathered together. I don't want my sin to hinder uh, one of my brothers or sisters in Christ. I don't want a sin that I've I've, uh, I'm guilty of to, to hinder uh, the Holy Spirit. I don't know exactly how it, I, I preach a message on how the Holy Spirit works and, and the Holy Spirit goes to the lowest level. A spirit, the Holy Spirit is compared to oftentimes as, as water. And how does water flow? Well, water flows to the lowest point possible. And the Bible says God, uh, God resisteth the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, and so I want to have a humble heart as I worship the Lord, uh, and and I want because I want the Spirit of God to to uh, to fill me and use me as only He can. I want to be a usable vessel. I want to be a channel for God that He can use, and He can't use me if I'm full of sin, if I'm full of self. In the Old Testament, we're familiar that. Uh, that uh, the Holy Spirit didn't indwell people like he does today in the New Testament dispensation. Uh, the Old Testament, there was the tabernacle, and then there was the temple. And within the tabernacle and the temple, the, that's where God would dwell. Uh, but then now, since the resurrection, uh, God said he would send the comforter, which is the Holy Spirit of God. And those of us that are saved, we have the Spirit of God living in us now. And so today, God indwells us as, as believers, uh, but the most concentrated uh, form of God's presence is, is may, might I say, is in the assembly of His believers. Uh, how many of you have been to a service and, you, and they said, man, the Spirit of God was thick in there. They made something like that. God was all over that service, or God was all over. You could, you could sense God there. Well, I, I, I want to be careful not to, not to have my 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 walk with God, uh, my my physical experiences or or those type of experience. I want to I want to be careful because truth always triumphs over feelings and and experiences. Amen. Uh, so I want to be careful, but but I believe we can understand and see that God dwells corporately with His believers as well. Number ten, digital pastoring is difficult pastoring. Is that even a thing, digital pastoring? Uh, in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, the Bible says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock of God over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. He's talking about the to the pastors, uh, the, uh, uh, the elders, the, the deacons and such. Take heed to the flock of God over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers 
to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. <clears throat> and so, you know, all except for being able to go on uh, people's individual profiles, and, and that's where I get a lot of my sermons to, to see the, the sins that you guys are struggling with and such. And <laughs> Just kidding. Kind of. Uh, but it's out there, and I'm, I got to be careful. My stuff is out there too, right? And so, uh, except for uh, those conveniences, how in the world is a pastor supposed to, uh, to, to, to visit and, and pastor a church that never assembles? Um, how's he supposed to feed the flock of God that doesn't assemble? How's that supposed to happen? Digital pastoring is uh, difficult pastoring. Number 11, baptism and the Lord's Supper were not intended to be isolated and individual, uh, individual practices or individual what do we call them? They are uh, ordinances. Yes, sir. Uh, they're not ordinances that were established to be done individually at home. I'm, I'm hesitant to ask how many have had the Lord's Supper at home online. <laughs> uh, more power to you, I guess. I guess I can see it if you're sick, you, you, you know, your car wasn't able to, to bring in or something. I don't know, but but uh, that's those weren't intended to be like that. Uh, baptism was an in, intended to be a, a public display of what's taken place on the inside of, of us. Uh, please don't tell me you got baptized in the privacy of your bathtub, okay? That's not scriptural. Um, I'm thankful if you got immersed in the bathtub, I guess, better than sprinkling. But, um, but uh, those two ordinances were were geared to be public things. Acts chapter 8, verse 12 says, When they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus, they were baptized, both men and women. And, of course, we understand there are passages as they were assembled. They partook, uh, they, uh, partook of the Lord's Supper and they're in the upper room, the, uh, the Last Supper there. It was the disciples that were gathered together around in fellowship and around the Word of God there. And uh, then number next here, we're moving on and we're going to be done here. Two more points. Church discipline would be nearly impossible virtually. Now, it's something we don't necessarily like talking about, but church discipline is in the Bible. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4, uh, it talks about an instance that church discipline was practiced. And it says, In the name of our Lord Jesus, when you are gathered together and my spirit... With the power of our Lord Jesus, it says in verse number five, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And so, yes, church discipline, it's still in the Bible and it's still practiced. It needs to be practiced occasionally. Uh, but a little background on this passage here. Uh, why were they doing it? Well, there was a man uh, who had been uh, physically with his mother-in-law. And that was being outspoken in the church, within the church. People knew uh, what was that sin that was taking place. And so there needed to be discipline. There needed to be correction. And so God said uh, to give him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, uh, but that his spirit might be saved. Now, I'm not saying that because we got any of that happening here, but we, we understand the importance of the assembled church. Sin has consequence. And saved people still sin. Uh, but the point is, uh, the gathering was necessary, and it's necessary into the future as well. Number 13, and lastly, why is it important for a church to assemble? Well, first of all, because that's what the word means, to assemble. Uh, number, number, I'm not going to go through them all, but number 13 because developing and ordaining church leaders is nearly impossible virtually. The Bible says it gives the qualifications of, of uh, some of these here. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, uh, 2 uh, talks about a bishop must be blameless, husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, uh, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. As we have uh, seen the descriptions here this morning of what takes place at church, uh, we see that most of the description can only be done in community 
as a gathering. Amen? Now, this is way back at one of my beginning points, but online stuff can be distracting. And, and uh, I was talking, I got to say this, I got because it's hilarious, okay, Brother Tito? He was uh, just an illustration of how it can be distracting. Kids were doing a kids were doing a online. He told me a story of some kids who were doing online schooling. One of them, which was with, uh, in one of his kids' class, and and uh, so you can imagine the teachers got twenty five students that are that are, and you you guys aren't dumb to understand that your kids can put your teacher on their teacher on mute right if they want to, <laughs> and teacher could probably do that too. I'm sure she can, but anyway. Um, there was online schooling taking place, and then police were called to a family's house because the teacher said that she had heard some physical abuse going on uh, with the parents uh, that were uh, at the at the household there. And so the the police came over, and they were they asked the they interviewed the kids, and they interviewed the the parents to see what was going on, if there was abuse going on, and. And there wasn't anything, and so uh, either there was or they got the wrong household. And so, uh, anyway, just uh, just an idea there that, uh, how many of you would like that? <laughs> how many of you parents would like that? Then CPS got involved, and and so the parent had to show that, uh, let the police in there, that there was none of that going on in the household. But, but uh, most things are better in person as we close here uh, this morning. If church became all virtual, it would become the end of the church. While online services, I believe, have their places and and they can be used as a tool for God, it ought not replace the physical gathering of the church. And so if you're watching at home and if you're watching just simply for for convenience, uh, man, I want to encourage you, hey, realize and recognize what church is. It's an assembly. And then may we pour ourselves out into being a regular part of this physical gathering of the local church that God has led us to. And so LifePoint family this morning, we need to gather to become what God wants us to be. And I believe that will allow us and help us to be a mighty church for the cause of Christ. Let's bow. Let's bow this morning. Let's pray.